Brother Joab, for those who don't know me. And I, today I just wanted to go over the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah, so you, if you shall call it. Um, so with that, for those who are celebrating the feast this month or whether you celebrate it next month, I just wanted to say happy um, Feast of Dedication. And let's get into the definition of the Feast of Dedication and why do we as Israelites celebrate the Feast of Dedication. So the the um, the dictionary says dedication means an act or right of dedicating to a divine being or to a sacred youth. And that's what happened with our people. The the temple was desecrated by the Greeks. So we um we rededicated the temple back to the Most High, and that's what I'm going to get into today. So like I said, the reason why we celebrate the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah, Hanukkah means dedication, is because our temple of the Most High was desecrated by the heathens, and we um Judas Maccabees rose up and rededicated the temple back to the Most High, and we're going to get into that. So like I said, for the ones who are celebrating the feast this month or the ones who are celebrating it next month either or so, so happy feast day and all praise and lord's will we can get some understanding on the feast of dedication which is celebrated in the ninth month of Kaslu on the 25th day so let's get into it in the book of daniel's i'm gonna start at daniel chapter 5 and i'm gonna start at verse 25 and it says and this was written that was and this was the writing that was written Meaning, meaning, to Kel of Harzan, verse 26. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meaning, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it, verse 27. To Kel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting, 28. Pared, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians, verse 29. Then commanded Belshazzar. And they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. So Belshazzar, he was the king of Babylon during this time. And um, verse 30, And that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. Verse 31, And Darius the Mede took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. So what was going on was... The prophecy was made, the Most High wrote on this wall that Belshazzar was going to get slain. And he was slain later that night. And Darius the Mede took up and rose to be king. Um, he was the king of the Medes and the Persians. So let's go to Daniel's chapter 8 and I'm going to go to verse 1. Now this was during that time. And it says, Daniel's 8 verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, who we just read about in Daniel's 5, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the verse. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that it was Shashun in the palace, which is the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. So I'm going to jump down to verse 11. Verse 11, Daniel 8 and 11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Verse 12, and the host was given him, and excuse me, and the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Verse 13, then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, how long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Verse 14, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So what Daniel saw in the book of Daniel chapter 8, he saw the temple being desecrated by these certain people. So we're going to get into that when we read in the Apocrypha and the Maccabees. So Daniel saw he foresaw the temple being desecrated by the Greeks. And he said, How long is it going to um and he said one saying to another saying, How long is it going to be? And it said two thousand three hundred days. And then when you look up that, that's about six and a half years. And then um when you look up the Maccabean revolt, it lasted for about six and a half, seven years, from one sixty to about one sixty six, one sixty seven. So Daniel saw this and he prophesied about it. And this was King Belshazzar, you understand? And remember, we just read in Daniel 5 that King Belshazzar, he was later killed by Darius the Great. So we're going to read um, 
we're gonna go into the we're gonna jump right into it because I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to hit the key notes of the scripture and why we celebrate the feast of dedication or Hanukkah. So um, we're gonna go to the first book of the Maccabees, chapter one. And it happened that after Alexander, son of Philip the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chittim, had smitten Darius, the king of the Persians, the Medes. Now we just read in the Daniel five that Darius took over after um, Belshazzar. You understand? So we're going to, um, so it says, and he reigned, uh, excuse me, I'm going to read it again, I'm sorry. And it happened after that Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chittim, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians, and Medes, and he had reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. So Alexander, the so-called great, he was the first king of Greece. He smote Darius. The Persian and me that we just read about in Daniel's fire. So now this man, Alexander, so they call him so-called great. He conquered pretty much the Middle East and minor Asia. He was conquering almost. He was getting up there to Europe. He pretty much had the whole uh, atmosphere conquered over there. And it says, and made many wars and won many strongholds and slew the kings of earth. So Alexander, he was a young, he was a young man. He rose up and slew many of the kings. He was a great warrior. That's why they call him so-called the great, Alexander the Great, because he conquered many kings and killed a lot of them. Verse 3, and went through to the ends of the earth and took spoils of many nations. That's why I said his kingdom reached all the way down to minor Asia. He was co conquering everything. And so much that the earth was quiet before him, whereupon he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. Verse 4, and he gathered a mighty strong host and ruled over countries and nations and kings and became tributaries unto them. So that means they came to pay him monetary tributaries. Alexander the Great. And it says, verse 5, and after these things he fell sick and perceived that he should die. So after all these things, he conquered all these things. He died at a young age too. I think it was like 26, 25 or something like that. So he died at a very young age, and the reason how he died because he was a homosexual, and he was having sex with one of his best friends, and he caught syphilis. And at the time, he got um when he caught syphilis, the Most High put him to death because of that. Verse six. Wherefore he called his servants, such as were honorable and had been brought up with him from his youth, and parted his kingdom among them while he was yet alive. So so some people say, or the scholars to try to save his name that. Oh, he was poisoned and he died. One of his friends betrayed him and poisoned him. No, he caught syphilis from a homosexual lover and he was put to death by the Most High. So verse 7. So Alexander reigned 12 years and then died. So his reign was only about 12 years and then he was um, put to death by the Most High. Verse 8. And his servants bear rule everyone in his place. Verse 9. And after his death, they all put on crowns upon themselves. So his servants put on crowns upon themselves. And we're going to get who those servants were in a second. And it says, verse 9, And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them. Many years and evils were multiplied in the earth. So verse 9 is very important because we, we learn in school that through the Greek empire, because Alexander the, the so-called great was a, a Grecian, was a Greek from Kittim, Macedonia. We learn through the school system that the Greeks... You know, they created philosophies, you know, you got Socrates and um, Pluto and all those things. So they, they taught us algebra and math and how to be civilized. But what, what does the scripture say? I'd rather um, obey God rather than man. So the scriptures say, verse 9, And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years. And evils were multiplied in the earth. So it says evils were multiplied in the earth. When these Grecians began to rule and take power... Evil was multiplied in earth. They was doing wickedness in the sight of the Most High. And we're going to get into that. So much wickedness that they even dared to come against Jerusalem and um, desecrate the temple. And that's what we're going to get into. Because remember, this is the Feast of Dedication. And what happened to rose up during the time of the Feast of Dedication. And how the, we as Israelites, our ancestors, stopped it. You understand? Verse 10. And there came out of them... A wicked root. So out of these men that put crowns upon their head, their sons and sons and sons, so on. Out of them came a wicked root. Antiochus, surnamed Epiphany. So this was, we have to understand history because a lot of people, a lot of Israelites get tripped up on this. There's four Antiochus. And that's what a, that's what Kemet or the conscious community might bring up. Oh, Antiochus, you don't know, but this is Antiochus the fourth. 
We have to understand that, Israel. Antiochus is the fourth, Epiphanes. So it says, and there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surname Epiphanes. So Antiochus is the fourth, son of Antiochus the king, that was Antiochus is the third, who had been in hostage at Rome, and he reigned in the hundred and thirty-seven year of the kingdom of the Greeks. And in those days there went out of Israel a wicked man. Actually, before that, backtrack, um, when we go back to um, when I said that those um, men put on crowns, these were those men that Alexander generals, after he died, put on the crown. It was Cassander, Ptolemy, that's where you get the Ptolemy, Ptolemaic Empire up in Egypt. So it was Cassander, Ptolemy, Antugas, and Seleucid. That's where you get the Seleucid Empire from as well. That's the empire that Antiochus grew up in, which was Seleucus. He actually surpassed Seleucus. So we're going to get into that in a second as well. So it was Cassander, Ptolemy, Antigas, and Seleucus. These are the four men that put on the crowns when, um, when after Alexander the Great was put to death. You understand? So it was those four generals and their sons and their sons that rose up and did wickedness in the earth. And the evils were multiplied by these men and their sons. So going back to the first Maccabees, it says, verse 10, And there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surnamed Epiphanes, Son of Antiochus the king, who had been in hostage at Rome, and he reigned in the hundred and thirty-seventh year of the kingdom of the Greeks. And in those days went out of Israel wicked men. So I, we always had wicked men in Israel, brothers and sisters. Always, all through generations, whatever captivity, there was always wicked men trying to cleave and do things to the, to the customs of the heathens. You understand? Who persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us. For since we departed from them, we have had much sorrow. So it says that since we departed from these heathens, it was much sorrow. So we were sorrowful. Instead of praising our God, the Most High God, we wanted to attach ourselves to the heathens and be like these heathens. Because we didn't, th we didn't trust in the Lord. Just like today, we don't trust in the Lord that he's going to save us from our captivities. That's why we turn to all these different idols and all these different um, foolish gods. Because we don't trust in the Most High God that he's going to redeem us. You understand? Verse 12. So this device pleased them well. Verse 13. Then certain of the people were so forward were in, and they went to the king who gave them license to do after the ordinance of the heathen. So these men went up to the king, and he gave them the license to do wickedness. You understand? Whereupon they built a place of exercise at Jerusalem, according to the customs of the heathen. So they built a Greek, what do you call it, a Greek gymnasium. And we're going to get into the scriptures to that as well, too. In Jerusalem, after the customs of the heathen. So they built a Greek gymnasium after the custom of the Greeks. You know, when the, when the Greeks um, did the Olympics and all that stuff naked. Israelites wanted to do that. And they built that place in Jerusalem, the city of David. You understand? Verse 14, whereupon they built a place of exercise at Jerusalem according to the customs of the heathen. Verse 15, and made themselves uncircumcised and forsook the holy covenant and joined themselves to the heathen and were sold to do mischief. So why? So us breaking these laws, statutes, and commandments, the most I said, okay, you want to do this? Don't worry, I'm gonna, I got a surprise for you. So he sent the Greeks and the Syrians and the Romans against us because we wanted to join ourselves to these Greeks and become Hellenized. And that's when you get Hellenized Greeks from in the New Testament is from the Apocrypha because this is the missing captivity. The Greek captivity is the missing captivity in the New Testament because the Old Testament stops at the Babylonian captivity and then it goes into the Roman captivity. But what about the, um, the Greek captivity? And this is what we're about to read about now. It's the Greek captivity and what they did to our temple and to our ancestors. So I'm going to jump down to verse. Cause like I, said, I just want to get to the key points. I don't want to um, drag this out much longer. I'm going to get to the key points of the scriptures. I'm going to um, jump down to verse. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go down to verse 30. And it says. Um, no, sorry. I'm going to jump down to verse. 20. And after that, Antiochus had smitten Egypt. He returned again in the hundred. Forty and third year and went up against Israel and Jerusalem with a great multitude. Why? Because we was in sin. So it says, Antiochus, verse 20, Antiochus. And after that, Antiochus had smitten Egypt. He returned again in the hundred and forty and third year and went up against Israel and Jerusalem with a great multitude. And entered proudly into the sanctuary and took away the golden altar and the candlestick of light and all the vessels thereof. 
and the table of the shoe bread, and the pouring vessels, and the vials, and the censers of gold, and the veil, and the crowns, and the golden ornaments that were before the temple, which he pulled off. So this is the start of the desecration of the temple. So th this right here is the beginning of the Greeks destroying our temple of our forefathers. Do you understand? Verse 23, he took also the silver and the gold and the precious vessels. Also he took the hidden treasures which he found. Verse 24, and when he had taken all away, he went into his own land, having, a, having made great massacre and spoken very proudly. But we're going to read what happened to this, um, to this Edomite that the Most High put to death for being so proud and coming against the servants of the Most High and destroying our temple. We're going to read about him and what the Most High did to him. Because his death is not a pretty death. So, um, Most High judged him accordingly. You understand? So, um, we're going to go jump down to verse 25. Therefore, there was a great mourning in Israel in every place there were. Why? Because the, um, these Grecians, these Greeks, was destroying our temple. And our people had made a covenant with them. And it says, there were great mourning. Verse 26. So that the princes and elders mourned, the virgins and young men were made feeble, and the beauty of women was changed. Why? Because we were being ravaged. Our, our men was being slaughtered by the sword. We were being starved out. Verse 27, every bridegroom took up lamentation. So everybody was mourning at the time. And, verse, um, and she that sat in the marriage chamber was in heaviness. The land also was moved in the inhabitants thereof, and all the house of Jacob was covered with confusion. Verse 29, and after two years fully expired, the king sent his chief collector of tribute unto the cities of Judea, who came to Jerusalem with the great multitude. So these Grecians here, they was, they was already starting to evade Jerusalem. So they set up their armies and they was already occupying our city at the time. You understand? Verse 30, and spake peaceable words unto them, but all was deceit. For when they had given him precedence, he fell suddenly upon the city and smote it very sore and destroyed much people of Israel. Verse 32, but the women and the, I'm going to jump down to verse 32. But the women and children took they captive and possessed the cattle. So this is the curses of Deuteronomy 28. They was going to take our women and children. Do you understand? So this is what was going on. These curses has not just happened during the so-called African transatlantic slave trade or the sub-Saharan slave trade. These curses have been happening to us. Since what? Since the Syrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, the Grecian captivity, the Roman captivity. We always went into some type of captivity or went into some type of slavery. So this was going on. The Greeks took our women and children and sold them into slavery. Verse 33. Then builded they the city of David, so in Jerusalem, with a great and strong wall and with mighty towers and made it stronghold for them. So these heathens conquered our city, Jerusalem, the city of the great king, and set up their own controls in that city. And it says, and they put there with a sinful nation, wicked, wicked men, and fortified themselves therein. So they set themselves sinful people in this city. These Grecians were wicked, terrible men. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. But our people was right there with them, not all Israel. Some wicked men and women joined themselves to these men and did evil in the sight of the Lord too. And the Most High punished those men as well. I'm going to jump down to verse 41. Moreover... King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and everyone should leave his law. So, the, so all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Verse 43, yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. So this right here is the beginning of being Hellenized Greek as we read in the New Testament. No Jew or Greek. These Greeks, these Grecians, are the Hellenized Israelites that, uh, that adopted the Greek customs. And we're going to get into that more. Verse 44. For the king had sent letters by messengers into Jerusalem and the cities of Judea that they should follow the strange laws of the land. Verse 45. And forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple that they should profane the Sabbath and festival days. Verse 46. And pollute the sanctuary and holy people. So we just read about this. And Daniel's chapter 8, 2,300 days is the stuff that's going to go on, which is about six and a half years. So this is the beginning of the sanctuary being polluted by the Greeks. Verse 45, and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple that they should profane the Sabbath and festival days. So we profane the Sabbath and the feast days. 
from the commandment of the king, Antiochus. Remember, this was Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. You can Google him as a real person. He was doing the Seleucid Empire. You understand? Verse 47, or excuse me, verse 46, and pollute the sanctuary and the holy people. Verse 47, they set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts. Verse 47, verse 48, that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation. Verse 49, to the end that they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. So this is what was going on. Antiochus, he said, he gathered all the kings together and said, I want you guys to be under the rule of the Greeks. I want you guys to be like this. All the heathens said, okay. So that's why you get a lot of cultures similar to Greek customs today because they all conform to the manner of Antiochus, Epiphanes. And the Israelites, some Israelites, not all, some Israelites conform to that too. And that's why, like I said, when you read in the New Testament, you got Hellenized Greeks that conformed to the manners of the um of the Greeks at this time. So I'm gonna jump down to verse 54. Now the 15th day of the month, Kaslu, this is the ninth month, which is the month that we're in now. For some who don't believe and some who do believe, I'm not gonna get into that. But for the ones who are keeping the ninth month, this is the month that is talking about Kaslu. Now the 15th day of the month, Kaslu, and the 145th year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar and build a and build it idol altars throughout the cities of Judea on every side. Verse 55. And burnt incense at the doors of their houses and in the streets. Verse 56. And when they had rent in pieces the books of the law which they found, they burnt them with fire. So this is not the first time that they destroyed the books of the law. This, this is not the first time they do it. See, history always repeats itself. That's why the Most High said there's nothing new under the sun. This stuff has been happening to us. They set up the abomination of desolation. They set up false idols in our sanctuary and our temple they set up these false idols Israel they set up idols to Jupiter to Diana and stuff like that same thing you read about in the New Testament same thing and it says and they had rent in pieces the books of the law which they found so they took our they took our uh, Bibles and they ripped them up they took our, our tablets they took our papers that was written the laws of Moses on them and they ripped them up so that we cannot practice our laws but conform to their laws. You understand? And they found and they burnt them with fire. Verse 57. And wheresoever was found with any of the book of the testament. Or if any consented to the law. The king's commandment was that they should be put him to death. So whoever was found reading out of our own. We couldn't even read out of our own Bible. And if we were found reading out of our own Bible. We would be put to death. And that is, that is what's it called. I'll pray. I see you brother. Shalom. And it says. 57, wheresoever was found with any the book of the testament of any consented to the law. So if we were keeping our law, our feast days, our Sabbath days, you understand? The Feast of Tabernacles, you know, understand? All these feast days, understand? Uh, and it says, was put to death. I'm going to jump down to verse 60. At which time, according to the commandment, they put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised. So our women, the same thing that was going on in Egypt. They circumcising the women, you know, the children. They was hiding the children, the males and all that stuff. Just like they try to do in Egypt. They were killing all the women and the children. Same thing that's going on here. And said so at that time, according to the commandment, they put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised. Because our women and our men, some people still love the law. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to uphold the laws of the Most High God. Because they knew that the Most High was going to save them if they kept his laws and not conform to these heathen nations. Verse 61, and they hanged their infants about their necks and raffled their houses and slew them. They had circumcised them. So these wicked men are so wicked that they were killing babies because our babies were circumcised. And we were keeping the laws of Moses and the laws which was given to Abraham of circumcision. You understand? Verse 62, how be it many in Israel were fully resolved and conformed in themselves not to eat any un anything unclean. Verse 63, wherefore they chose rather to die that they not, might not be defiled with meat and they might not be profaned the holy covenant. So they, so then they died and there was a very great wrath upon Israel. So uh, some of our people, like I said, did not conform. Our people would rather be put to death than to break the laws of God. And that's, that's the spirit that we should have upon us. 
today, Israel, that we would rather die for the laws of God to conform to these other nations. But we have lost our heritage and discontinued our heritage, like it says in Jeremiah 17, so much that it is that we just so comfortable breaking the laws of God. Back in the day, we, um, we would die for these laws. We would die for the Most High God. But now we are so confused and we are so out of place, we would rather be anything else but our true heritage. And then we have to come back to the book and truly understand why these laws are so spiritual and why the Most High chose us as a certain people. And he gave us these laws to be set apart from these other nations. Now without these laws, now we were becoming like the Greeks, uncivilized, savage, beast. That's why they call us beast and savage. That's where they get that stuff from. Savages, beast. You understand? So we have to get out of that mindset and get back to the spirituality of things. It's not just... A book written for people. This is a spiritual book. Our spiritual book. That was written for us. You understand? So I'm going to go to. Like I said. I'm going to get to the key points. I don't want to um, take up too much of your time. So I'm going to go to um, 1 Maccabees chapter 2. And this is the start of the revolt of the Maccabees. Which led into Judas Maccabees and Simon his brother and all them. Fighting against the Greeks and getting them back to the temple. So I'm going to read these scriptures and get into it. 1 Maccabees chapter 2. Chapter of verse 1. In those days arose Mattathias, the son of John, the son of Simeon, a priest of the sons of Jerib from Jerusalem and dwelt in Modin. So this Mattathias, he was a direct descendant of Aaron. Aaron had Eleazar. Eleazar had um, Phineas. So um, Mattathias was a direct descendant of Phineas. So he is from the priesthood of Aaron, Mattathias, and his sons is from the priesthood of, Manathias, excuse me, of Aaron. So he is a high priest. You understand? And um, verse 2, and he had five sons. Johan called Caddis. Verse 3, Simon called Thassus. Verse 4, Judas, who was also called Maccabeus, which means the hammer. And uh, verse 5, Eleazar called Avron and Jonathan, whose surname was Aphis. And when he had saw the blasphemies that were committed in Judea and Jerusalem, verse 7, he said, woe is me. So a lot of people, I'm going to stop right there. A lot of people... From certain camps, they teach that woe means destruction. But if you do a, this, a simple Google, woe means despair or sorrow, sadness upon me, not destruction. So when he says, woe is me, I'm sorrowful, I'm despaired, I'm lamentating, I'm in mourning. So verse 7, he said, woe is me. Wherefore, I was born to see the misery of my people and of the holy city to dwell there. And when it was delivered into the hand of the enemy and the sanctuary to the hand of strangers... Her temple is become as a man without glory. So he's talking about the temple dedicated to the Most High God. This is the same temple that Solomon built. You understand? Verse 9. Her glorious vessels were carried away into captivity. Her infants were slain in the streets. Her young man with the sword of the enemy. Verse 10. What nation have not had a part in her kingdom and gotten of her spoils? So what nation of people? These Greeks, Syrians, Romans, they were all confederate together. And they all had a um, hand in ransacking the temple, you understand? Verse 11, all her ornaments are taken away. Of a free woman, she has become a bond slave. So Jerusalem was free. Now she has become a bond slave to the Greeks. She is in the Greek captivity. Verse 12, and behold, our sanctuary, even our beauty and our glory is laid waste. And the Gentiles have profaned it. So these Gentiles were the Grecians, the Greeks. They have profaned our sanctuary, which was in the city of David. You understand? Verse 13, to what end, therefore, shall we live any longer? Verse 14, then Mattathias and his sons rent their clothes and put on sackcloth and mourned very sore. So they ripped their clothes, put on sackcloth. What? They put dirt and stuff on their mourning clothes. And they were very rough and sore for Israel because this is a time for mourning. This is not a time for praise and glory. We were in, in uh, sin and the Most High was dealing with us accordingly because of our sin. So he sent the Greeks to destroy our temple. Which was prophesied in Daniel chapter 8. And it says, Then Mattathias and his sons rent their clothes and put on sackcloth and mourned very sore. I'm going to jump down to verse 17. Then answered the king's officers and said to Mattathias, On this wise, thou art a ruler and an honorable and great man in this city, and strengthened with sons and brethren. Verse 18. Now therefore come thou first and fulfill the king's commanded, commandment. Excuse me. Like all... At, excuse me, like as all the heathen have done, yea, and the men of Judea also, and such as remain at Jerusalem, so thou sh so shalt thou and thy house be in the number of the king's friends, and thou and thy children shall be honored with silver and gold with many rewards. So he tried to tell Mattathias, the priest, 
He tried to tell him, come on, just conform. Go on. Let's, let's um, do this king's commandment. Defile the Sabbath. Profane the Sabbath. Profane the festival days. Sacrifice slime, swine flesh. Become as a heathen. So this is what the man, the king's friend, told him to do. And let's see what Mattathias said. Let's see if he said, okay, you know what? I'm going to disrespect my God. Let's see, let's see what Mattathias said. Verse 19. Then Mattathias answered and spoke with a loud voice. Though all the nations that are under the king's dominion obey him and fall away every one from the religion of their fathers and give us consent to his commandments. Verse 20. Yet will I and my sons and my brethren walk in the covenant of our fathers. And that's the spirit that we should have today. We should walk in the covenant of our fathers. You understand? God forbid that we should forsake the law and the ordinances. We will not hearken to the king's words to go from our religion either on the right hand or the left. Verse 23. Now when he had left speaking these words, there came one of the Jews in the sight of all to sacrifice on the altar, which is Almodan according to the king's commandment. So this Jew, I guess, he didn't hear what was going on. So he's just in la-la land about to sacrifice on this altar. He did not just hear Mattathias give this proud speech that he was going to serve the Most High in his law. So let's see what happened to this foolish man. Verse 24, which thing when Mattathias saw, he was inflamed with zeal and his reins trembled so that he was shaking with the zeal of the Most High so hard that he, that he, was, he had it so bad that his, his body was shaken and his reins trembled. Neither could he forbear to shew his anger according to judgment. Wherefore, he ran and slew him upon the altar. So that's the same thing that happened with Nehemiah, righteous anger, with Phine, with, uh, Phineas, righteous anger. Also, the king's commissioner. Who compelled man to sacrifice, he killed at that time, and the altar he pulled down. Verse 26. Thus dealt he zealously for the law of God, like as Phineas did unto Zambri, the son of Salmon. Verse 27. And Mattathias called throughout the city with a loud voice, saying, Whosoever is zealous of the law and maintains the covenant, let him follow me. Verse 28. So he and his sons fled into the mountains, and he left all they that ever had in the city. So Mattathias gathered up a group of people, including his sons, to do what? To start up the Maccabean Revolt. That's why it's called the Maccabean Revolt, because it started off with Mattathias, but then when he passed away, it was bestowed, it was bestowed upon his son Judas Maccabees, which is, means Judas the Hammer. And he was called the Hammer because he was crushing these he was crushing these Syrians. He was crushing these Greeks. He was crushing these Romans. That's why he was called the Hammer. He was laying the, he was laying it down on these nations. He was a strategic monster when it came to the battlefield. You understand? So I'm going to jump down to verse um, 61. This is still um, chapter 2. I'm going to jump down to verse 61. And thus consider ye throughout all ages that none, of, that none that put their trust in him shall be overcome. Verse 62. Fear not then the words of a sinful man, for his glory shall be dung and worms. So it says, fear not the words of a sinful man. Why? That's going back to... Don't fear them that can kill the body, but fear him that can kill the mind, body, and soul. So don't fear man. Don't put your fear in man. Put your fear in the Most High because the Most High is the one that can kill your mind, body, and your soul. You understand? So that's what Mattathias was telling to his son. Don't fear man because his glory is dung and worms, especially the sinful man. He's not getting the kingdom. You understand? So it says, verse 63, Today he shall be lifted up, and tomorrow he shall not be found because he is returned to his dust. And his thought is come to nothing. Verse 64. Wherefore, ye my sons, be valiant, and shew yourself men in behalf of the law, for by it shall ye obtain glory. Verse 65. And behold, I know that your brother Simon is a man of counsel. Give ear unto him always. He shall be a father unto you. Verse 66. For as Judas Maccabees, he hath been mighty and strong, even from his youth up. Let him be your captain, and fight the battle of the people. Verse 67, take also unto you all those that ob observe the law and avenge ye the wrong of your people. Verse 68, recompense fully the heathen and take heed to the commandments of the law. Verse 69, so he blessed them and was gathered to his, excuse me, he was gathered to his fathers. Verse 70, and he died in the 146th year. His sons buried him in the sepulchers of his father at Modin. And all Israel made great lamentation for him. So Mattathias, the Levite, passed away and he left charge to his son Simon 
the wise counsel. Judas Maccabees would be the captain of the host because he was a mighty man. And all Israel lamentated for him because he was a righteous brother. And he led Israel in the right direction, keeping and following the laws of the Most High God. You understand? So I'm going to go to First Maccabees chapter 3, verse 1. Then his son, Judas, called Maccabeus, rose up in his stead. Verse 2. And all his brethren helped him. And so did they that held with his father. And they fought with cheerfulness the battle of Israel. So he got his people great honor and put on a breastplate as a giant and girt his warlike harness about him. And he made battles protecting the host with his sword. Verse um, 4. And in his acts he was like a lion and like a lion's whelp roaring for his prey. I'm going to jump down to verse 7. He grieved also many kings and made Jacob glad with his act. And his memorial is blessed forever. So Judas Maccabees, like I said, he put the hurting on these heathens. He rose up. He had the spirit of the Lord on him. He rose up and he smote many of these kings and fortresses because they came into Jerusalem and declared war and, and desecrated our temple. You understand? So from there, um, that, that was, I just wanted to get into Judas Maccabees and what he was doing and, um, and how he became who he was. So I'm going to go to um, 1 Maccabees chapter 4. And I'm going to start at verse 1. Then took Gorgas 5,000 footmen and 1,000 of the best horsemen and moved out of the camp by night. Verse 2. To the end he might rush in suddenly to the camp of the Jews and smite them suddenly. And the men of the fortress were his guides. Verse 3. Now when Judas heard thereof, he himself removed and the valiant man with him that he might smite the king's army which is at Emmaus. I'm going to jump down to verse 10. Now therefore let us cry. Actually I'm going to start at... um. Verse 7, and they saw the camp of the heathen, it was a strong and well harnessed and composed around with horsemen, and they were expert at war. Verse 8, then said Judas to his men that were with him, fear ye not their multitude, neither be ye afraid of their assault. Verse 9, remember how our fathers were delivered in the Red Sea when Pharaoh pursued them with an army. Verse 10, now therefore let us cry unto heaven at peradventure, so perhaps... The Lord will have mercy upon us and remember the covenant of our fathers and destroy this host before our face this day. Verse 11. That so all the heathen may know that there is one who delivereth and saveth Israel. Verse 12. Then the strangers lifted up their eyes and saw them coming over against them. Verse 13. Wherefore they went out of the camp to battle that they were with Judas sounded their trumpets. Verse 14. So they joined battle and the heathen being discomfited fled into the plain. So they blew the trumpet. Let's see where they, where they got this from. Because this was a law for Israel to blow the trumpet at the times of war. So that the Most High would deliver us from battle. So let's go to Numbers chapter 10. And Judas Maccabees, he was a Levite priest. So he, he understood this. So um, Numbers chapter 10 and verse 9. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you. Then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. So that was Numbers chapter 10, verse 9. That was the law that Judas Maccabees, he upheld. So I'm going to jump down to verse 24. After this, they went home and sung a song of thanksgiving and praised the Lord in heaven, because it is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Verse 25. Thus Israel had a great deliverance that day. So they, de they defeated um. Gregorius' army of 5,000 men, Judas Maccabees and his um, brother and his um, band of rose. So this is one of the many battles that Judas Maccabees won in the name of the Lord. And how we, this was the building step, the stepping stones of how we got our temple back. So I'm going to come back to 1 Maccabees chapter 4. But from here I want to go to, um, to 2 Maccabees real quick. 2 Maccabees, I'm going to go to chapter um, 4. I'm going to start at verse 7. 2 Maccabees chapter 4 verse 7. But after the death of Seleucus, remember this is one of the, the generals of Alexander that put on one of his crowns. This is where you get the Seleucid Empire from. And this is where Antiochus IV rose up from the Seleucid Empire. And it said, after the death of Seleucus, when Antiochus called Epiphanes, remember this is Antiochus IV, called Epiphanes, took the kingdom, Jason the brother of Onias, labored under underhand to be high priest so jason and all the, these brothers was um benjamites so they had no place being high priest anyways 
So it says, verse 8, promising unto the king by intercession 300 and threescore talents of silver and another revenue 80 talents. Verse 9, besides this, he, pr he promised to assign 150 more if he might have license to set up a place for exercise. So this is going back to um, 1 Maccabees. It's, 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 some of the order is chronologically out of order, but it's okay. Because technically it says that you're supposed to read 2 Maccabees before you read 1 Maccabees. So this is 2 Maccabees. This explains 1 Maccabees more in detail. So it says, so this man, um, Jason, he wanted to buy the priesthood. And he went to Antiochus and he, ch he got Antiochus to, to get him the priesthood because he bought the priesthood. You understand? And it says, besides this, he promised to assign 150 more if he might have license to set up a place of exercise and for the training up of youth and the fashions of the heathen and to write them in Jerusalem by the name of Anti Antiochians. That's where you get Antioch from in Greece. It's from this man. And it says, verse 10, when the king had granted and he had gotten into his hand the rule, he forthwith brought his own nation to the Greekish fashion. So this man, J Jason, the so-called high priest, he bought the priesthood. When Antiochus was king, so he brought his own nation to Greekish fashion. So he, by turn, this man caused a lot of Israelites to become Greeks, Hellenized Greeks. You understand? Verse 10, which when the king had, oh, I'm sorry, verse 11, and the royal privileges granted a special favor to the Jews by the means of John, the father of Epolemus, who went, um, who went ambassador to Rome for amenity and aid, he took away and putting down the government which were according to the law, he brought up new customs against the law. Verse 12, for he built got gladly a place of, place of exercise under the tower itself and brought the chief young men under his subjection and made them wear a hat. Verse 13, now such was the height of Greek fashions increase of heathenish manners through the exceeding profaneness of Jason, that ungodly wrench and no high priest. So even the scriptures call him, it says, an ungodly wrench and no high priest. Why? Because he had no business being a high priest. Him being a Benjamite and the high priest office was for the Aaronites. You understand? Aaron and his sons and his sons. Until we, but to make no mistake, now we are in the new covenant. So we have a new high priest, which is Christ. But this is the Old Testament. So the high priest was supposed to be of the lineage of Aaron. You understand? That the priest had no courage to serve any more at the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifice, hastened to be partakers of the unlawful allowance and the place of exercise after the game of discus calling forth. So they were doing Greek Olympics playing discus. That's a play that the game that you play with um track and field, shot put, discus, all this they were participating. This comes from Greek fashions. You understand? So um, it says, verse 15, not setting by the honors of their fathers, but liking the glory of the Grecians, best of all. So they took off the glory of our fathers, of our forefathers, us being Israelites, and they put on the fashions of the Greeks. They found Greek culture more fascinating than our own Israelite cultures, which is a, which is a shame. And it says, verse 16, by reason, wherefore sore calamity came upon them, for they had them to be their enemies and avengers, whose custom they follow so earnestly. Unto whom they desire to be like in all things. Verse 17. For it is not a light thing to do wickedly against the laws of God. But the time following shall declare these things. So Most High sent these Greeks, Antiochus, to come into Jerusalem and slaughter these men for their sins. It said it's not a light thing to go against the laws of God. So just because the Most High doesn't punish you today, tomorrow, in a few months. If you don't repent, you're going to get punished. For breaking these laws, statutes, and commandments. It said it's not a light thing. Do not say that I have sinned and the most I have done nothing. It said do not take this as a light thing. The most I is going to get you. Your sin is going to catch up. Romans 6 and 23. The wages of sin is death. You understand? So the most I sent these Grecians. To, these Greek men. To the temple. And, and they desolated the temple. They desecrated the temple. You understand? So I'm going to um, 2 Maccabees 8. I'm going to go down to 36. Second, remember, this is all Judas Maccabees and them fighting and getting the temple back, pushing the Romans and the Greeks and the Syrians out of Jerusalem. Second Maccabees 8 and 36. Thus he that took upon him to make good to the Romans the tribute by means of the captives of Jerusalem told abroad that the Jews had God to fight for them, and therefore they could not be hurt because they followed the laws that he gave them. So we're gonna hold that. We're going to go to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 12. 
Wisdom, excuse me, Wisdom of Solomon. Yeah, Wisdom of Solomon chapter 12. And I'm going to start at um, verse 9. And it says, not that, not that thou was unable to bring the ungodly under the hand of the righteous in battle, or to destroy them at once with cruel beasts, or with one, word, one rough word, but executing thy judgments upon them little and little, thou gavest them place of repentance, not being ignorant that they were a naughty generation, and that their malice was bred in them, and that their condemnation would never be changed, so their deep thoughts would never be changed. And it says, for it was a cursed seed from the beginning. Neither didst thou thou fear any man give them pardon for those things where they have sinned. So they had a chance to leave Jerusalem. They had a chance to repent, but they didn't. And the Most High put those men to death, especially Antiochus. And we're going to read that in a little bit. What happened to Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV? So it says, if you keep in God's law, the ungodly cannot put their hands on you. You understand? So from there, I'm going to go to... Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to uh, first Macca Go back to First Maccabees, chapter four. And this is the um, after they. This is the battle that uh, the last battle that Judas Maccabees won, and they rededicated the temple. Well, not the last battle, but this is the battle that drove many of the Greek forces out. This is the one we read in First Maccabees four and one. It says Gorgias and the five thousand footmen. So this is the the crucial battle that Judas Maccabees won. He was later killed. And Simon rose up, and then Simon was killed, and so on and so forth. But um, Judas Maccabees ended up dead. He he did end up dying in battle. So um, First Maccabees four, and I'm gonna um, jump down to um, verse thirty six. Then Judas and his brethren, behold, our enemies are discomfited. Let us go up to cleanse and dedicate the sanctuary. Because remember, this is the feast of dedication. We rededicated the temple back to the Most High. You understand? So and dedicate the sanctuary. Verse thirty seven. Upon this all the host assembled themselves together and went up into Mount Sion. Verse 38. And when they saw the sanctuary desolate and the altar profane and the gates burned up and the shrubs growing in the courts as in a forest or in, in one of the mountains. Yea, and the priest chambers pulled down. Verse 39. They rent their clothes and made great lamentation and, class and cast ashes upon their heads. So they saw the temple just utterly destroyed. It was heartbreaking. Because this is their, our temple, their temple. This is the temple that was dedicated to the Most High God where you did the burnt offerings, the sin offerings, the Day of Atonement offering. All the, This was the temple that Most High instructed Aaron and his sons to upkeep. And when they saw it, it just was heartbreaking. You can, if I was there, I can just imagine the same thing. This was the temple of our God. And it was destroyed by these heathens. So when they saw it, it broke their heart. I'm going to read that again. And it says, they rent their clothes and made great lamentation and cast ashes upon their heads. So they ripped up their clothes. They were, frilled, they were filled with mourning and they put ashes upon their head. That's how we lamentated back in the day, Israel. When you read Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations, we always lamentate. We always rent our clothes and cast ashes and sackcloth upon us. Verse 40, and fell down flat to the ground upon their faces and blew an alarm with the trumpets and cried unto heaven. Verse 41, then Judas appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress until he had cleansed the sanctuary. Verse 42, when he chose priests of blameless conversation as had pleasure in the law. So it's not just whoever wants to fight. These men had to be upkeeping the law and know the law and they had blameless conversation. There wasn't no strife, envying, grudges, hateful towards one another. It was men that loved the Most High and loved his brother. These are the men that fought with Judas Maccabees. These are the men that helped cleanse the temple. It wasn't sinful men in Israel. It was upright men that uphold the law. You understand? It wasn't just anybody that joined the army. It was men that upheld the law and had the glory of the law, the zeal of the law for the Most High God. Verse 43, who cleansed the sanctuary and bare out the defiled stones into an unclean place. Verse 44, and when they had consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profane, verse 45, they thought it best to pull it down. They should be a reproach to them because the heathen had defiled it. Wherefore, they pulled it down. Verse 46, and laid upon the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should be come to a, excuse me, there shall come a prophet to shew what should be done with them. Verse 47. Then they took whole stones according to the law and built a new altar according to the former. So let's get that in Exodus. They were See these men knew the law and they were upkeeping the law. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20 and see why they used whole stones 
and not they didn't cut stones and make an altar. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20 verse 25. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. So it said thou shalt not build an altar of hewn stone, of cut stones. For um, of hewn stone. For if thou lift up a tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. So it says, if you build an altar, you're not supposed to cut it. You're supposed to just use regular stone. Otherwise, you're going to pollute that stone. Because why? This is set apart holy to the Most High God. You understand? So going back to it. And it says, verse 48. And made up the sanctuary and the things that were within the temple and hollowed the courts. Verse 49. They made also new ve holy vessels. And into the temple they brought the candlestick and the altar of burnt offerings and of incense and of the table. Verse 50. And upon the altar they burned incense. And the lamps that were upon the candlestick they lighted, and they might have light in the temple. Verse 51. Furthermore, they set up the loaves upon the table, and spread out the veil, and finished all the works which they had begun to make. Verse 52. Now on the fifth and twentieth day of the ninth month, which we are in today. Today is the twenty-fifth day of the ninth month. You understand? And the hundred and the month cast loo, which is the ninth month. You understand? In the hundred and forty-eighth year, they rose up. And between times, and between times, in the morning, and uh, verse fifty-three, and offer sacrifice according to the law upon a new altar of burnt offerings which they had made. Verse fifty-four. Look at what time and what day the heathen have profaned it. Even in that was it dedicated with songs and ch ch uh, excuse me, and harps and cymbals. Then they, all the people fell upon their faces, worshiping and praising the God of heaven. Who has given them good success. Verse 56. So they that kept the dedication of the altar at eight days. And offered burnt offerings with gladness. And sacrificed a sacrifice of deliverance and praise. So um, the, the feast of dedication is to last eight days. You understand? And I'm going to jump down to verse um, 59. Moreover Judas and his brethren with the whole congregation of Israel ordained that the days of the dedication of the altar should be kept in their season from year to year by the space of eight days from the fifth and twenty-fifth day of the month cast loose with mirth and gladness. So now these eight days Israel is a time to celebrate. We don't have to do Thanksgiving. We don't have to do Christmas. This is our day. This is our day of gladness in the winter. You understand? This is the day that we celebrate because our brethren, our ancestors, took back the temple which is dedicated to our God, to your God. These are the days that we're supposed to celebrate. We don't celebrate these pagan feast days. This day of feast of dedication, this is the day of gladness. This is the day that we should celebrate. This is the day of rejoice. Why? Because our brethren were man enough to stand up to these heathen and take back the, the temple. They weren't afraid to shed the blood. They weren't afraid to... um. To get dirty, to get back what was ours. You understand? So this is the day that we should be celebrating. The Feast of Dedication. Hanukkah as it is called in the Hebrew. And it says, And, um, and at that time they built it up the Mount Zion with high walls and strong towers round about. Least the Gentiles shall come and tread it down as they had done before. And they set up their garrison to keep it and fortified Beshera to preserve it. That the people might have a defense against Idumea. You understand? So it said they build up a fortress and garrison. They put they build up these weapons to fortify the city. You understand? So from there I'm gonna go to um, Second Maccabees nine. Cause remember we want to talk about what happened with Antiochus and how the Most High he got what he deserved. The Most High put this wicked man to death. So Second Maccabees chapter nine verse one. About that time came Antiochus with the dishonor out of the country of Persia. Verse two. For he had entered the city called. Persopolis and went about to rob the temple and hold the city whereupon the multitude running to defend themselves with their weapons put them to fight flight excuse me and it so happened that Antiochus being put to flight of the inhabitants returned with shame verse 3 now when he had come to Ecbatane news was brought with him what happened to Nicanor and Timothus and Timothy excuse me verse 4 then swelling with anger he thought to avenge upon the Jews the disgrace done unto him by those that had made him flee. Therefore commanded he his chariot. His chariot man to drive without ceasing. And to dispatch the journey. The judgment of God now following him. For he had spoken proudly in this sort. And that he had come to Jerusalem. To make it a common burying place of the Jews. So he had come with war in his mind. He came back to avenge himself. 
But let's see what the Most High does to this man, this proud man. <clears throat> Verse 5, But the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, smote him with the incurable and invisible plague. For as soon as he had spoken these words, a pain of the bowels that was remedy, uh, remedy, uh, list came upon him. So, uh, so it said without remedy. That's what it means. Sorry, I, I misspoke that word. And sore torments of the inner part. So he had a very nasty stomach virus come upon him that nobody could cure or give him remedy for. And it says, verse 6. And the most justly, for he had tormented other man's bowel with many strange uh, instruments. So reap what you sow. It says this man tormented other man's bowels with strange instruments. So the same thing that came upon, he did to other man came upon him. The most high is a just God. You understand? The vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So it says, verse 7, how be it? He nothing at all ceased from his bragging, but still was filled with pride. So after all these internal bowels and stomach virus and the nasty virus that he had, he was still proud. And it said, breathing out fire in his rage against the Jews and commanding to haste the journey. But it came to pass that he fell down from his chariot, carried violently, so that having a sore fall, all the members of his body were much pain. So he was speaking proudly and speaking and saying, no, get me faster to the Jews. I want to kill these Jews. He fell out of his chariot and the horses dragged him. You understand? Verse 8. And thus he had a little afar, though he might com uh, command the ways of the sea. So proud was he beyond the condition of man. So this man was the proudest man at this time. You understand? He said he was so proud that he thought that he could command the ways of the sea. This Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes. You understand? So it says, and thus he had little afore thought that he might command the waves of the sea. So proud was he beyond the condition of man and weighed the high mountains in the balance was now cast on the ground and carried in horse litter, showing forth unto all the manifest power of God. So this man's death was to show the power of the Most High God, that the Most High was always in Israel. Do you understand? Verse 9, so that the worms rose up out of his body of this wicked man, and whilst he lived in sorrow and pain, his flesh fell away, and the filthiness of his smell was noisome to all his army. Verse 10, and the man that thought a little for he could reach the stars of heaven, no man can endure to carry for his intolerable sting. So this man, he was so proud that he thought that he could reach up to the stars of heaven, the most I cast him down to the earth. On the ground, literally dragged by horses in a horse litter. He was literally dragged through horse dung. You understand? Verse 11. Here, therefore, being plagued, he began to leave off his great pride and come to the knowledge of himself by the scourge of God, his pain increasing every moment. Verse 12. And when he, and when he himself could not abide his own smell, he said these words. It is meet to be subject unto God, and that a man that is mortal should not proudly think of himself as if he were God. So the Most High humbled this man, this great man that came with ransacked Jerusalem and set up these laws and profaned the Sabbath and holy days. The Most High humbled this man down, and he said, verse 13, This wicked person vowed also unto the Lord, who now no more would have mercy upon him, saying thus, verse 14, that the holy city... To which he was going in haste to lay it even to the ground and to make it a common burying place. He was set at liberty. Verse 15. And as touching the Jews whom he had judged not worthy as so much to be buried. But to be cast out with their children to be devoured of the fowls and wild beasts. He will make them all equals to the citizens of Athens. Now this was in Greece. So he set the Jews to liberty. This man the Mosai put it in his spirit. Because he was so proud the Mosai smote him with sore ailments. That he's, he changed his mind quick. He said, you know what? Let these Jews go. Let them be at peace. Verse 16. In the holy temple, which before he had spoiled, he will garnish with, godly, with goodly gifts and restore all the holy vessels with many more. And out of his own revenue, defray the charges belonging to the sacrifices. Verse 17. Yea, and all that he would become a Jew and, and, and yea. And that also he would become a Jew himself and go through all the world that was inhabited and declare the power of God. Verse 18, but for all his pains would not cease for the judgment of God was come upon him. Therefore, dis despiring of his health, he wrote unto the Jews the letter underwritten containing the form of supplication after this manner. So he said that he was humble so great that he said if it were possible, he would become a Jew himself. That's so bad the most I jacked this man up. He jacked him up so bad, he wanted to convert to become a Jew and to praise the living God. You understand? 
Verse 19, Antiochus, king and governor, to the good Jews, his citizens, which have much joy, health, and prosperity. Verse 20, if ye and your children fare well, and your affairs be to your government, I give very great thanks to God, having my hope in heaven. Verse 21, as for me, I was weak, or else I would have remembered kindly your honor and good will, returning out of Persia. And though it is necessary to care, oh, excuse me, and being taken with the grievous disease, I thought it necessary to care for the common safety of all. Verse 22, not dis distrusting mine health, but having great hope to escape the sickness. Verse 23, but considering that even my father, at what time he led an army into the high countries, appointed a successor. So basically what he was saying, he was letting the Jews go and eventually the Most High put him to death. He ended up dying. So that, that's what happened to Antiochus. He was a proud man, Antiochus IV. Epiphany, he was the proud man that set up the um the Greeks into the sanctuary. So he was the one that um desecrated the, that was the beginning to desecrate the temple. Do you understand? So the most I humbled this man and put him to death, dragged him through the dung, put sore um ailments on this man so that he might repent and so he might say, I want to become a Jew. So let's see. So that was the old testament. So that, that was the feast of dedication. Mattathias, Judah Maccabees, Simon, all his brothers. They all had a part in um, rededicating the temple, and as long as the armies that fought with Judas Maccabees as well, you understand? So, um, like I said, and Mattathias, Judas Maccabees, and all those brothers, they were direct descendants of Aaron, the priest, from Phineas, you understand? So, let's go to the New Testament in John chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. So, a lot of Jews, a lot of Israelite, Old Testament Israelites, say that this was dedication for. Nehemiah and Ezra them when they rededicated the temple, but let's look in the um the strong concordance for um dedication of this month. It says in particular it says dedication concentrate uh yeah uh, dedication concentration in particular the annual feast celebrated eight days beginning in the twenty fifth month of Kaslu, initiated by Judas Maccabees in memory of cleansing of the temple from the pollution of Antiochus Epiphany. So this dedication that Christ was celebrating was not the dedication the, the the temple of Ezra and Nehemiah or Solomon this was the dedication that Judas Maccabees and the revolt which led to the dedication the recleansing of the temple so Christ himself celebrated the feast of dedication or Hanukkah if you will so with that brothers I pray brothers and sisters I pray that this lesson was edifying and that we all come back to our nationality whether you celebrating the feast this month, or we're celebrating it next month in December. I pray all you brothers and sisters to have a happy feast and let's feast and be glad and merry these eight days and give all praises through the Father, through His Son Christ, which He sent to redeem us. So, with that, Israel, I say shalom, peace, and blessings.